by the way, the, the, girls, the girl who brought the two bunnies, one for Ted Baxter there and the other one for me, um, and the, she said she wanted to be a writer. I loved her answer because, you know, basically she sees the connections of, of things. And that's one of the things that I think outdoor education uh, gives kids that being in that cubicle just doesn't. So, um, by the way, those bunnies, she walked up and she gave one to the reporter and one to me. And, you know, you saw us petting them. And then after the cameras went off, she leaned over to me and she says, the one that you're holding is the wild one. And I've never seen it so calm. <laughs> and then I looked down and I felt wonderful, of course, but then I realized I'd been holding that bunny a little too tight. <laughs> no, 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 I made that part up. <laughs> Everything's true except the last line. <laughs> my family never trusts my last lines. You know? <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the reason I, I'm glad you saw that is that we, we need many more films like that. We need to show people this, not just talk about it. And, um, you know, it, I wish they'd had way more kids in there. And they had footage that I saw that was just hilarious and wonderful. And these kids are the best sales, way better than the, than the principal or the teachers, the best salespeople for this idea. They were so eloquent. And um, one little boy, six-year-old, raced into the classroom after a learning hike, raced into the classroom and said, uh, Miss Miller, Miss Miller, there's so much nature out here. I've only got two eyes and one brain. I think I'm going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> really did. Just like that, too. <laughs> oh, it was great. And one of the, I should mention that Steve Nigren, uh, who is on our board, had something to do with the creation of that, that school. Uh, Serenby, a community that is uh, devoted to immersing the residents in nature, is nearby. Um, also, I want to say that, you know, I often have to repeat, often, I'm not anti-tech. Sometimes I may sound it, but I'm not. That school was started by a techie. It was started by the guy who created Howard Dean's internet presidential campaign, the first presidential campaign that was really fueled by the internet. Uh, and he also did it for Obama. And then he spent six months in working in the White House on tech. And uh, he left, uh, kind of frustrated with the pace of government, moved to Georgia, and he started that school. He's still a techie. He's not anti-tech. I know that because I still got whiplash from his Tesla when he took me to the airport. <laughs> Those things accelerate. Um, and um, I, th I thought that was significant because we need the technology leaders on our side. Um, right now in the schools, the people who determine the real future of the schools are, um, is really the technology industry. We think it's other people, but it's really them. They're, they're the biggest economic force that is shaping the future of schools. And they know what kind of schools they want in the future. And it has nothing to do with going outside, at least not yet. It has everything to do with more and more iPads, more and more computers. Um, the good news, they say, is testing as we know it will fade away. We won't need it anymore because uh, the computers will you know, all, every gadget they use at school and at home, uh, every keystroke they make will be measured and quantified. In other words, won't need testing anymore because the machines will be watching the kids all the time. Uh, there was an article a few months ago in New Yorker about a so-called cutting-edge school in Brooklyn. It was an elementary school, it was upstairs, no playground. And the kids there were, of course, immersed in technology, long hours. Um, and there were literally, and you can read this in The New Yorker, there, were, there are literally fisheye cameras in all of the walls, watching the kids all the time, measuring, quantifying, studying these kids. I don't know about you, but I find that kind of creepy. Um, where is the lobby for balance? I'm not talking about anti-tech. I'm talking about balance, just, and not even 50-50, you know? but just some kind of better balance for 
for, for, for our kids in our schools. Where is the lobby for that? There is no economic force big enough to stand up to the technology folks who have product to move. There is, though, a social force, and that's you. And again, I'm not saying stand up against technology at all. I'm saying stand up for balance. Um, and the, the truth is that the technology leaders know this, just as my friend who started that school knows this. Uh, Steve Jobs did not let his kids play with iPads. Bill Gates, turns out, is a similar kind of parent, and he bought property in Seattle, a huge piece of land, stream running through it. He wanted nature for his kids, you know. Uh, we're, I think we've tried to get to him, to get him on board, but have not been successful so far. We want to talk to him about other kids, other families' kids. Uh, and it's amazing how many of the tech leaders uh, in Silicon Valley have uh, cabins up in the mountains, off the grid, where they go to be restored, to re be re-energized, so they can come back down and write better code and so forth. They know that. I want to recruit them. If any of you know any of those folks, like the guy who started that school out there, they're in the technology fields, please invite them to be leaders in this movement. I will, you know, there are so many leaders here. I want to thank, by the way, CJ for doing such a great job throughout. <laughs> and I want to thank Sarah Milligan and all of the hardworking folks of CNN for putting on what I think is the best CNN conference yet. Thank you, Sarah. Where are you? Can you stand up, Sarah, please. There she is, way back there. And I'd name all the rest, but, you know, I'd run out of time. And also, I have to say, this is very intimidating. These speeches, speakers have been so good. Dr. Christopher, Mayor Coleman, who's here, I believe. Are you here, Dr. M Mayor Coleman? Yep. Thank you for coming. Uh, how do I follow you? I mean, that story you told, I'm still kerplunked, or whatever that word is about that. I mean, really, truly, and Gail Christopher, uh, I, I, you know, how moving and deep that speech was. Um, this conference, like all of them, I've learned so much. I hope that you have, too. Uh, I think one of the themes that has emerged throughout the conference is the, the theme of healing that Dr. Christopher talks about so eloquently. Also, as CJ says, expansiveness, not inclusiveness. Changing the way we think about these things to turn kind of negative phrases into positive phrases about the future. Um, and then to act on those phrases. One of the, the things that I've talked about for a while is what I call natural cultural capacity. Why is it that somebody that looks like me puts on their REI day pack and marches into a neighborhood where people don't look like me and tell them how to connect to nature? What if we turn that around and ask them how their cultures, when I say we, what if I turn that around and ask other cultures how they connect to nature? Uh, there's a long history of African-American environmentalism that most of us know nothing about. Uh, Latino uh, families. Uh, in some ways, the recent immigrants are far closer to a, a heritage of nature than people who look like me. Um, one woman, and I forgot to find out her name, and I'm sorry, but you're here, I hope, was so eloquent, sitting next to me in one of the breakout sessions. We were talking about uh, natural cultural capacities, and I asked about myths and, and rituals of other cultures in terms of that connection to the natural world. And she said that when she was growing up in Mexico, uh, her, she was where the monarch butterflies would come through. And her grandmother would say to her, don't touch the butterflies. Don't touch the butterflies. And she would say, why? And her grandmother says, because those are the souls of children who have passed. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, to think about nature in that way, the integration of our souls into the rest of the natural world. Um, I want to 
do something I don't usually do. I want to read a couple things. One is from this alleged new book that I'm working on that's really given me fits, I have to say, about the human relationship with other animals. But it, in, this particular passage, I think, includes, I think, a truth that applies to this idea of healing and connection. First, I want to tell you a story. I was fishing one day on, I like to fish alone sometimes, and I was fishing in my little boat on a lake in San Diego with my trolling motor, and I saw on the shore what I thought were two big vultures eating a big carp, dead carp on the shore. So I pulled up closer and closer and got within 20 feet of them, and they were not vultures. They were two big golden eagles with their biceps were like that. Amazing. And I started going back and forth, 20 feet from them. One of them flew away and circled the mountain, came back down, and they were eating the carp, looking up at me, looking up at me, eating the carp. And I kept going back and forth, and the eye contact was always there. And something happened in that moment. Um, I came home and told my younger son, Matthew, whoever I say I am, who I was in those moments is who I really am. Can't really explain it. Can't find the words. But this is what I wanted to read, which I think explains it a little bit. And, and I do this in the context of hoping that in the next steps of our, of our movement, that we begin in some way to focus on not just the other animal or plant and not just on us or our children, but that which is between us, between us and the animal, between us and the plant, between our children and the rest of nature. Something is there. So let me read this. Something at once new and very old is emerging in the philosophical thinking about our relationship with other animals, not only among, say, wildlife biologists, but among all of us, perhaps uh, even across the borders among species. An ethic, a practice, a discovery, a being present, a paying attention. It's amazing what you can see if you look. Amazing what you can hear if you listen. Amazing what you can know if you are knowable. Not long ago, I joined my friend Scott Reed at a local coffee shop. He is one of the most prominent community organizers in the U.S., uh, whose decades of work have been rooted in churches in poor communities. He is moved by Pro Pope Francis, um, who took his name, obviously, from the patron saint of animals. He attends mass frequently. He is profoundly spiritual, my friend Scott. When I spoke with him about the themes of the book I'm struggling with, he was immediately drawn to the phrase, quote, life-changing encounters with species not our own. Scott is fascinated by such encounters and the mystery of what emerges in that space between a human being and another animal or person. He paraphrased Martin Buber, the soul is over there, not in heart or head, but over there. In a similar vein, Buber wrote, when two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is in the electricity that surges between them. Scott understood intuitively that the essential nature of that moment, defined as an instant or an expanse of time, is relationship. The it that rises from or is created between creatures of the same creation. Like many of us, Scott is drawn to those videos of unlikely friendships, if friendships is the right word, between animals of different species. One reason those YouTube videos proliferate is because they do express an endangered value in our society, connectedness. And Scott said, this is what Buber called the sacredness of the I-thou relationship. The divine is in you as well as me, and you discover it only in relationship. He said, a culture of hyper-individualism doesn't teach us about our connectedness, 
our web of relationships with the other people or to something larger. He said, that's the web of life, the, con the connectedness that I feel when I'm in nature. My breathing is easier there. The oxygen is plentiful. The smell of the leaves, the breath of life, all of it is connected, he said. A social scientist once asked Scott why it is that 95% of Americans believe that economic inequality is bad, but 97% don't believe there's anything we can do about it. I don't know if those statistics are still true. He thought about this for a few moments and said, the difference between now and 30 years ago is that then we were able to create connections and connected institutions that could deal with complex problems, but we reject public institutions and their connections now. That reinforces the notions, notion that the hyper-individual is paramount and the, that the web of life does not have any relevance. But many of us do want a better deal for ourselves and for others, including species not our own. A case can be made that proliferation of videos of animal friends, the rapid growth of the pet population, the tentative revival of nature study and education, the movement to leave no child inside, offer evidence of our hunger for connectedness to be held again by the web of life, fading now but still resilient. Not long ago, Scott was diagnosed with aggressive stage three cancer. He has continued to work and travel. As he shared this news with me, he paused, his voice grew softer. He described how one evening when he returned from a long trip, even before his family could welcome him, his large dog leaped up, pushed him back and held him, wouldn't let him go. What was that, he asked. Love, yes something larger than recognition or even affection. There was another quality to it, a third entity that rose between Scott and his dog. At home or in the wild, Scott has experienced that moment many times, what Buber described as the electricity of God rising between two creatures in full connectedness. How do you articulate such a mystery, Scott said. The philosopher Godel has written about the incompleteness theory, that in any system there are truths that cannot be proven. That's what you're getting into when you try to name that it, as you call it. Trying to show something that all the evidence points to, but still can't be proved. This is familiar to those of us who are convinced that there is a mystery beyond us. To recognize that it is, in fact, a leap of faith or the use of a sense that we cannot identify. Here is another leap. That thing that has no name, that yearning, that whisper of recognition between two beings when time seems to stop, when space assumes a different shape, in that moment we sense our own soul or the soul we all share. That is what rises between the dog and the man, between the fisherman and the golden eagles on the shore, and between you and me. Um, I, two months after Newtown occurred, the massacre, I was invited to Newtown to give several speeches. Um, I was invited then because the, the health professionals there knew that the real trauma would hit in about three months. So after the massacre of all those children in that school, they were looking for any way they could to soften that trauma. So I was invited, and they tried many other things as well. I can't tell you what it's like to have a, a mother come up to you and tell you that her s child was there and survived. There weren't any parents there whose children had died. Um, the violence of nature itself is a fact, but this is also true. By assaulting nature, we raise the odds that we will assault each other. By bringing nature into our lives, we invite humility. By creating meaningful connections between people and nature, we can potentially reduce human violence in our world. We've seen how experiences in nature can build a sense of community and can help bring families and friends closer together in loving ways and can bring us 
all to a sense of shared meaning that transcends our differences. There's a time for hypervigilance, and there's a time to pay a different kind of attention. In a recent op-ed, Larry Rosen, MD, is one of our uh, friends as a physician, a champion of the children and nature movement, shared this definition of mindfulness from the three questions, a children's book based on a story by Leo Tolstoy. Quote, realize that the most important time is now. The most important person is the one you're with. And the most important thing to do is what you're doing right here, right now. That you will never make all of the stress in the world disappear. Take time to look in someone's eyes, listen to her story, and let her know that you hear her. Be willing to sit in the mud until it settles and the water clears. Beyond our homes and cities and nations, a great river flows through a larger community. It moves inexorably toward this conclusion. All children need nature, not only those whose parents appreciate nature, not only those of a certain economic class or culture or set of abilities, all children and future generations have a right, a human right, to a nature-rich future and the option to share in the responsibilities that come with that right. The path along the river and through the woods is no panacea, but our kids deserve a break and so do we. To create memories that can last a lifetime, we can start by taking our children and grandchildren on a hike. We can enrich our homes with native species, plant school gardens, rethink the environments of our neighborhoods, prescribe nature, and much more. We can create richer, more peaceful life for all of us. And as the years go by, we can return to that special place in our heart where wonder still grows. Um, I mentioned that the, uh, that this book is out, it's out there. This is the book that has delayed the animal book. And the reason I did this, it's uh, vitamin N, it includes 500 ways to enrich the health and happiness of your family and community. The one thing they got wrong in that video was it's not just about adults, it's not just about kids either. Uh, and it's, a book, it's a, one of those books, it's a list of ideas that people can do. And I collected these ideas over the last 10 years. Uh, from, from you and from great other books that I have read that I cite in here and recommend, uh, from mayors, from uh, doctors, uh, from teachers, and I think it's a pretty good list. And it's not only about your home, how to make a nature-rich home and garden, it's about your nature-rich neighborhood, creating a nature-rich school, creating a nature-rich library, creating a nature-rich city, not just sustainable. You know, William McDonough, the great green guru, likes to say, do you really want a sustainable marriage? Don't you want something better than that? <laughs> but a nature-rich city, a nature-rich civilization. So, if you could show them that, that slide. One of the ways we're going to use uh, this book, and others, not just this one, is we're going to launch the Vitamin N Challenge. And it's a challenge not toward you, but a, a request that you challenge the people you know, the people you serve, uh, to pick a few things in the book and try them, and then report back to us. Write a blog. Put your ideas on Twitter or Facebook. Tell us about your innovations. Um, and this page that will be set up will make that easy to do for people. Uh, this is 500 ideas. We need 5,000 ideas. We need engagement. We need connection with the people that we are trying to quote unquote help. They can help us. We can help each other. Um, so I hope that this will be um, useful uh, to you, that page. You don't have to buy the book. You just, you know, you get the idea from the thing. And the, there's a postcard on your tables that tells you a little bit more about it. Let me uh, end by um, uh, saying something about, you know, we all need to know what the next steps are. 
One of the reasons that I pushed this book ahead, even though I really would rather have worked on the animal book during that time, is because I've be become convinced, reluctantly convinced, that we all need lists. We all need next steps. We all need ideas. And here you have a whole generation or much of a generation of young parents who didn't have, weren't privileged like I was to have that experience with nature when they were kids. And they need a list. And they want nature. They do. I have a lot of hope for the millennials. I really do. I was in Vancouver uh, just a couple weeks ago. And I met a young biology teacher there, a 28-year-old biology teacher who insists on getting his kids, his students outdoors. He's a real natural teacher. And he takes them to the mountains. He, it's easier to do in, in Canada than it is here because of the legal restrictions and bureaucracy and all that. But he really gets his students out. And he says most of his students have never been out in nature. A lot of them are Chinese immigrants. And he uh, said he gets them out there and they resist at first, and then they don't. They resist until they don't. And when they don't, there's a transformation that happens. And then they can't seem to get enough of nature. And the reason is, is because it's new to them. I like to tell about my grandmother who, when I was four years old, I can remember walking with her hand in hand in Independence, Missouri, walking along, and she would stop in her tracks with me and point at the sky and says, look, Richie, it's an aeroplane. And she said the aeroplane. She, had, she was born in 1884. She had kids when she was older. And aeroplane. I got so sick of her stopping and pointing at the sky and said, look, Richie, there's an aeroplane. To her, airplanes were still new. She was in awe of them. Now to us, not so new, not so much awe. Computers. People my age are still in awe of computers, maybe even scared of them. They're still new to us. To millennials, not so new. They were born into that age. They're all around them. They're living the virtual life. Uh, so what's new? You know, they, they don't really like CGI. They're not impressed by all of that. They're really not that impressed. My sons are like that. They're really not that impressed. They use them, just second nature. And yes, they use them too much, just like I do. But it's not new. It's not novel. What's new? What's novel? When that 28-year-old uh, biology teacher explained to me why his students were so turned on by nature, he said it's because it's new to them. That's the novel thing to them. I think we can do a lot with that. So I want to uh, also say that um, history is littered with the good intentions of cultural movements that never reach their full potential. I'm thinking. I've been thinking about the, the, um, the nature study movement of the first part of the last century. It happened around the same time as uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. These two ideas, nature study movement, was really big culturally. It, people were study, going out on hikes and studying and doing nature journals, and it permeated into education a bit, and it was uh, connected to the spirit. It was connected to spirituality. It was really big culturally. This is at the same time that Frederick Law Olmsted created Central Park, and, and uh, the idea in city design then, urban design, was design for health. They knew how many steps it would take, to, should take, to get to the neighborhood park. Both of those ideas were great ideas. Nothing we're talking about here, or nothing I talk about in my books is new. But those ideas faded and almost went away. Very few people know today about the nature study movement. City design, urban design, architecture took a very different route. But now, those ghosts of those two movements are returning. And we're seeing those ideas come back. Not fast enough, but they're coming back. 
But I think we have to be careful because they disappeared. There's no guarantee our movement will live forever unless we make it live forever. And that will happen partly because it begins to permeate the ec economics of our culture, but it will also happen because individual families and individual people and teachers and pediatricians take a stand and do something, do something. And I think our greatest challenge now is to help people take that next step, give them a list of things to do. They want to do it. Um, I've said for a long time that, um, that and, I, and I, always, I, I need to find a better way to say this, but programs are great. We need all the programs to connect kids to nature that we can get. We need three times, five times as many as we got. But even if we got that many programs, it won't be enough. Because programs, including Children Nature Network, have to focus most of all on self-replicating social change or cultural change. That means things that people do themselves that are contagious. Family nature clubs is one of those ideas. Somebody sees somebody else in a family club, they want to join it, they're having fun. Somebody says, that family nature club has too many people, I'll create my own, I'll download a toolkit on how to do it and create my own. Now they're propagating all over the Canada, the Canadian Wildlife Federation is here, they're having great uh, uh, progress. We're, we're um, uh, uh, partnering with them, we're working with the cities project to make sure Family nature clubs are uh, all over the place, along with uh, um, schoolyard gardens. Uh, that's a contagious idea. We need 50 more contagious ideas. It's one of the things I hope happens when people begin to send in their own ideas. I'm convinced that there's a lot of people who have a lot better ideas than I do. And I want their ideas about contagion. Contagious ideas that are self-replicating, that we plant the seeds for, but then they take off and they change the culture. Ultimately, that's what we're about. Not only great programs, but deeply changing the culture. And I'll end with another thing that I'd like to read to you. I think in addition to that, we need to move beyond our silos, beyond what we think is possible. We need a new vision of the future. I've become convinced over time that most Americans, if you ask them to conjure up images of the far future, what will it look like? Almost always those images look a lot like Blade Runner or Mad Max, or at best, The Hunger Games, at least there's a few trees. It's a, the number one young adult fiction genre for several years has been uh, called dystopic fiction. It's about a post-apocalyptic world in which not even vampires are having a good time. <laughs> That's the number one young adult literature. Uh, I'm not against dystopic literature. I think it's great. 1984 was a great uh, warning that we didn't listen to. It's not, it's not the point. It's the point is, what happens to a culture when it doesn't have another set of images of a wonderful, beautiful, great, better future, not just sustainable, not just energy efficient, but beautiful, great, nurturing to humans and nature. What happens to a culture when it doesn't have that? And you've all heard me, some of you have heard me say, Martin Luther King demonstrated and said many ways that any movement, any culture will fail if it cannot paint a picture of a world that people will want to go to. So one day, I had been saying that a lot, uh, and I shared this six years ago or five years ago at one of our gatherings. And it's in the back of the, the, uh, the Nature Principle. The, the reason I wrote this is because a young high school student at one of my speeches stood up and said, well, Mr. Lou, um, you, you talk about an image of a, images of a future that we'd want to go to, what's your images? What's your view? Tell us what kind of future you'd like. And I said, well, uh, <clears throat> I've written two books about that. She says, I don't want to read your books. 
tell us, tell me, what kind of, what's your vision of the future if you're so high and mighty about this? Uh, she said that, actually. <laughs> And so I went home, so I did my best, and I gave a kind of a shotgun description, and then I went home and I wrote it down and worked on it, and I've, uh, just in the last year or so, I've touched it up a little bit. So I'd like to end with this. Imagine a world in which all children grow up with a deep understanding of the life around them, where all of us know the animals and plants of our own backyards as well as we know the televised Amazon rainforest, or better. Where the more high-tech our lives become, the more we experience nature in our lives. Where we come to know all of our senses, including our sense of humility. Where we feel more alive. We seek a newer world where we are not only conserving nature, but creating it, where we live, work, learn, and play. Where yards and open spaces are alive with native species, where bird migration routes are healed by human care, where wildlife corridors in every city serve as the bronchial and arterial passages of life and meaning. Where not only public space, but private property voluntarily Garden to garden, yard to yard is transformed by us into a worldwide homegrown park. Where cities become incubators of biodiversity and engines of human health. Where developers transform decaying suburbs and inner city neighborhoods and redundant aging shopping malls into eco villages that provide more natural habitat, green roofs and wildlife and child life corridors that help bring back butterfly and bird migration routes, where empty lots become natural play spaces and community gardens, where sky skyscrapers become vertical farms with spirals and decks and roofs that produce food and enrich the health of people and other animals, where through biophilic design, built environments not only conserve energy but produce it, including human psychological energy, health, higher productivity and creativity because nature is woven in to where we live, work, learn, and play. Where natural history becomes as important as human history to our regional and personal identities. Where history is defined less by the battle of war and more by the stories of our kinship. Imagine a world where streams in cities and countryside are restored, unearthed to the daylight, their natural curves and life returned. Where rural towns, now deserted, return in a new form, internet connected, surrounded by organic farms, edible prairies, and beauty. Where every hospital offers a healing garden, and pediatricians and other health professionals prescribe nature. Where park rangers become para-health professionals, where antidepressants and pharmaceuticals are needed less and nature prescribed more. Where obesity of children and adults is reduced through nature play. A newer world where the point of education is not rote and drill, but wonder and awe. Where education uses the power of the natural world to stimulate our ability to learn and create. Where hybrid minds are nurtured, amplifying both the sensory and creative benefits of the virtual world and the natural experience. Where every school has a natural space where children experience the joy of learning through play once again. Where teachers are encouraged to take their students on trips to the nearby woods and canyons and streams and shores. Where educators feel their own sense of hope and excitement returning to their profession and to their own hearts. Imagine a world where connecting people to nature becomes a growth industry, where new businesses emerge to help us transform our homes, our workplaces, our lives through nature, where the restorative and healing powers of the natural world and the measurable and immeasurable worth of watersheds and natural systems are included in every regional economic study. A newer world where children and adults feel a deep sense of identity with the bioregions in which they live, where libraries and their neighborhood branches become hubs of bioregional awareness, 
where people on their own create tens of thousands of family nature clubs that embrace millions of children, parents, grandparents, and those with no family at all. Where human nature, social capital, enriches our daily lives, and where, as a species, we no longer feel so alone. Where children experience the joy of being in nature before they learn of its loss. Where they can lie in the grass on a hillside for hours and watch clouds become the faces of the future. Where every child and every adult has a human right to a connection to the natural world and shares the responsibility for caring for it where every child, regardless of race or economic status or gender or sexual identity or a set of abilities, has the opportunity to create that relationship. Imagine a world where the strength of our spirit is not measured by the specificity of our language, but by the care and kinship we share with each other and with our fellow species on this earth a world in which our first and last days are lived in the arms of Mother Nature, of land and sky, water and soil, wind and sea, a newer world we seek and to which we return. Imagine a world in which the rest of nature to which we belong brings us together across political, professional, racial, and religious divides where our lives and the lives of our children are made gentler. Thank you.